So this is going to be a story about data heroism. Um, so first of all, why should those of you watching this video actually care about disaster data? Well, large parts of the United States are actually at risk of catastrophic disasters. And as we all know, there's the possibility of earthquakes in lots of places like San Francisco. But we may not know that many large cities are actually at risk of catastrophic flooding, like New York City. And looking at a map from this angle actually gives us a little emotional distance. So if we look at the map this way, you get a better sense of what that risk means. This is the effect of a Category 2 hurricane storm, uh, Category 2, um, assuming a little sea level rise between now and the end of the century, which, of course, we'll have. So if you're thinking, ah, this, when it won't happen, you people in New York, that's not going to happen. We thought that in New Orleans, too, didn't we? We thought that it won't happen, and then it did. So it's going to happen, just so you know. So when this happens, what data is needed? Well, researchers have told us that there's a vacuum of data um, after, after a disaster happens for planning and resource allocation and long-term recovery. What is the first data that you get after a disaster? You get photos from the media. So does this tell you anything about where people are, how much aid is needed, where you should send your money? Does this tell you where to provide aid? And more recently, we've seen photos like this, right? Now, other sources of data will likely crop up as techies around the country pitch in their expertise to help with the crisis. And this is great, but I'm going to suggest another approach for how to provide needed data in a crisis by telling you a little bit about what we did at the data center. The data center was actually founded long before Katrina to help New Orleans civic leaders use data to work smarter and more strategically. In 2001, we published a very easy-to-use website with data covering demographics and housing and poverty for all 73 New Orleans neighborhoods. And each web page covered a large but really carefully selected set of data for that neighborhood. And the data we chose was designed to answer 80% of the questions that local nonprofits had. And for the other 20%, you could ask a question of a real live person. Now, before Katrina, the website was used quite a lot by local groups for grant writing and planning and advocacy. And then Katrina, and we evacuated. Now, notice that our web server was in Kentucky. As we were evacuating, we realized that all the other crucial websites in town would go down. City Hall, Tulane University, all the major institutions, because the city would lose power, and our website would stay up. So we anticipated that traffic to our website would skyrocket, which it did. But our website didn't have a lot of relevant information on it. But because we knew New Orleans so well, we knew that one piece of information we could quickly post would, that would answer a pressing question would be an elevation map of the city to give a sense of which parts of the city might flood should the levees fail. So from her remote location, our GIS specialist immediately developed and posted an elevation map of New Orleans on our website. And the next day, the levees did fail. And then the questions to ask Allison came flooding in. Like this one, I'm involved in mapping and analysis for uh, the EPA. The neighborhood map you have is great, and all the other maps. I'm trying to help build our spatial library for the response and would like to get a shape file for the neighborhood boundaries. So we answered these kinds of questions. We answered a lot of questions like this. We're finding your website really helpful as we're trying to learn a lot in a short period of time about the neighborhoods in New Orleans. Many thanks. A very basic question, is the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward, the Old Ninth Ward, all the same neighborhood to the east of the Industrial Canal? I think they finally figured that one out. We got a lot of questions like this. I need elevation data on Jefferson Parish. We evacuated for Katrina. Please help. I live in Metairie on Jeanette Drive. We got a lot of questions like that. And we got a lot of questions like this. Was there flooding at 46 something something Painter Street in the Gentilly area? My sister is there alone and did not evacuate. It's a three level home, but if you know anything, please, in God's name, please email us. So, from our remote locations, we started answering these questions. We knew that if folks were surfing the web, were having trouble using the websites on these topics that were popping up nearly hourly, they needed some help. So we posted two frequently asked questions, FAQs, covering the various websites, giving clear and simple guidance on how to navigate these clearly difficult websites, and we updated our web pages hourly. We could not have anticipated that so many information sources would spring up 
nor that they would be so difficult to use, but because we had a simple mechanism in place for receiving and tracking information needs as they arose, we were able to respond on an almost real-time basis. So the lesson is you cannot fully plan in advance for what will happen once a disaster strikes, but because you will not be able to anticipate everything that will happen. This is just a given when it comes to disasters. Rather than have a full plan in place for what data to provide, you need to have a mechanism in place that will help you identify priority information needs as they arise and be nimble enough to respond to them. But I want to move past the emergency period and turn our attention to the recovery period, which takes quite a whole lot longer. So on the next few slides, I'm going to show you just a few examples of the most common data questions we received post-Katrina to illustrate the highest demand data following our particular disaster. Can you give me data on the number of residents in each parish so we can plan our case management service provision? Another nonprofit got asked, I'd like valid data you have for a post-Katrina population of Orleans Parish by neighborhood. A realty company asked us, we'd like to know the population trends on the West Bank of Jefferson Parish. We'd like to bring a particular major national client there by showing them that the population has boomed on the West Bank post-Katrina. And then Nielsen, media research company wrote us, we need daytime population figures for New Orleans to make informed decisions about the future of television measurement in the market. <laughs> well, as you can see, even those you think would know don't have the tools and techniques necessary to determine repopulation after a catastrophic event like Katrina, which caused massive population displacement. So for a variety of uses, the highest priority data post-Katrina was population data at frequent intervals for small geographies. And the U.S. Census Bureau cannot currently meet this need because they only have funding to produce one annual estimate of every county in the country with a nine-month lag time. Thus, after Katrina, we had to develop the population data ourselves. One of the first pieces of actual data that you will get following any disaster are, is a USGS map layer indicating the damaged areas, which you've seen already today. Now, we overlaid these on small area population counts from the previous decennial census to come up with the population of the non-flooded parts of the city as just a simple estimate of the number of folks who could potentially return to undamaged housing once the city reopened. And then later, we acquired and published monthly counts of households actively receiving mail from the United States Postal Service. These provided a good indicator of rapidly rebuilding neighborhoods and those that were lagging. Now, I'm making this sound relatively simple, when in fact, researching this data was many, many months in the making. And because the repopulation status of each neighborhood changed rapidly, we had to pub publish this data at frequent intervals. So the next few, few slides show you what it looks like. This map depicts the density of households receiving mail in July 2005 before Katrina, with dark blue indicating the densely populated areas and yellow indicating the swampy areas. So this is how New Orleans looked one year later, and one year later, and one year later in 2008. And now we publish this data at the block level in a Google mapper for public visualization, with the limitations clearly stated in plain English on the left. Um, now, and we update it monthly. Now, beyond population data, we got a lot of questions from parents and businesses wanting to know what schools were reopened to help inform their decision about whether or not to return. But this information changed rapidly as well. In fact, initially, it changed weekly, so we published it with a best used by stamp <laughs> so that information would not circulate past its useful life. Now, one of the most common questions we get here in New Orleans uh, post-Katrina is, how's the recovery going? You know, how's it going down there in New Orleans? Well, every New Orleanian gets asked this almost constantly, so for this reason, trend data is crucial. So for that reason, in partnership with the Brookings Institution, we started publishing the New Orleans Index to track the recovery of New Orleans using trend data. So by having a mechanism in place for identifying data needs as they arose, and then by de developing and disseminating the most reliable population data, and facilities data and trend data. The data center was able to meet many of the most crucial information needs following Katrina. And the last lesson is this. If you really, really want to democratize information, that is, get it out to everyone, the internet will not cut it. No matter how fantastic your website and your social media strategy is, you have to get on TV and radio. 
Not everyone uses the internet nearly as much as the folks who are probably watching this video. But everyone, nearly everyone, has a TV. In fact, many folks have more than one TV, and some of them have more than one TV on at the same time. So get on the TV and get on the radio, and then you'll really be democratizing information. So the lessons are, one, this could happen to you. Have a mechanism in place for identifying data needs as they arise, and if you really want to democratize data, the internet won't cut it. Get on TV and radio. Thank you.